Here to talk about the very latest in the fight against COVID and the resources we now have to deal with it is Dr. Abrar Karan with Stanford Healthcare. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Let's talk a little bit about immunity right now. A lot of people have already had COVID. We're talking about 60% of adults and about 75% of children. What does that provide us when it comes to levels of protection against future infections? This is a fundamentally important question. Uh, we are seeing the effects of this play out right now in real life with the BA2 surge, um, whereby we see a lot of cases, but we don't see as many hospitalizations. We're not seeing as many cases of severe disease. And part of this may well, in fact, be related to the large spread of BA1 that we had, which does provide some immunity against BA2. But what this means for the longer term, what this means for other variants that are under investigation, such as BA4 um, in South Africa, that really remains to be seen because there are a couple of factors at play. One is uh, time. So over time, we know that our humoral response, our antibody response will start to wane, right? Whether that's from getting vaccinated or um, getting infected. Now, the second part of it is how well do the neutralizing antibodies that our body has developed against previous variants work against new ones? Remember, the virus continues to mutate. There are regions of the virus that continue to mutate. And over time, that can evade the immune response of the body. So it's very hard to predict. And this is why you can't rely on just one part of the strategy. You can't just rely on maybe we'll have immunity or um, maybe we have a lot of people vaccinated because we're going to be dealing with more variants. This is not going away. And as you know, you know, there's already a lot of discussions about updating vaccines and having people get boosted again later in the year. There's already data showing that a second booster in higher risk elderly people can reduce the risk of severe disease and death by a significant amount. So this is always a changing field. Um, and that's very normal for us in medicine and public health. What could all this mean for potential cases of long COVID? This is a very big unknown. Uh, there are some preliminary data suggesting that if you're vaccinated, you have a lower risk of developing long COVID, but that data is not very robust yet. And that's to say that, you know, because we've dealt with different variants, uh, another question is, what is the risk of long COVID if you were vaccinated a long time ago, or if you are having multiple reinfections with different variants, like you got Delta, then you got Omicron, maybe you then got BA2. Um, we don't have all that data. And remember in everybody, it will look different, right? In some people, it could last for days to weeks in other people, months. I'll give you my own example. In January, I got Omicron. I was sick, I was out for 10 days. I couldn't take care of patients. And while I got better, I still had symptoms that lingered on. Um, and really the month of April is when I felt totally 100% back to normal. And you know, this is again, different for everybody. We've seen cases where People have more severe consequences, including blood clots. Um, that's one you know that we've seen more commonly. There have been people that come in and have fevers and have other immunological problems that were sort of we think set off by their initial COVID infection. So there's a lot we need to learn still. All right. Yes, a lot of concerns and so many unknowns. Uh, meantime, we're hearing about the possibility of vaccinations for very young children. Moderna is seeking emergency use authorization right now from uh, for kids from six months to five years old. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we need to see the data. We need to have it go through the appropriate process. Um, we need the FDA and, and all of our regulatory committees to review the data and make sure that this is safe. Um, and effective before we move forward. I know many parents are are waiting. This is what they're waiting for. They're waiting to make sure that their kids can be protected. And, you know, a lot of people brush this off to say, well, kids have a lower rate of, of mortality. Well, that's not the only metric that we should be looking at. It shouldn't be just that, oh, well, my kid may not, um, you know, die from this, right? What about all the other effects? Like you mentioned, long COVID, the inflammatory effects. What are the longer term effects on kids getting infected very young with a very novel virus? Uh, so I, I, I can empathize with parents waiting. Um, we don't want to rush this, right? We don't want to start pushing um, um, uh, vaccinations out without having all the data at hand. Um, but I am, I am keeping an eye on it and, you know, we're all looking forward to that.
Also, when it comes to children, uh, the possibility of using some of these treatments like remdesivir, where are we at with that? Yeah, so there is um, a sort of newer data suggesting remdesivir would be safe to use in younger kids. We've been using this from the very, very beginning of the epidemic, um, you know, all the way back into the 20, 2020, which seems like ages ago now. Uh, and then we had more recent data come out in adults showing that the earlier you give remdesivir, the better it works, the better chance you have to prevent progression. Um, and that's something we see with antivirals in general, like Paxlovid as well. The earlier you give it in that first five day window, you can prevent the virus from replicating too much um, and sort of slow it down. And so I think this could be an important um, medication to, to help uh, prevent progression for kids who are at higher risk, um, particularly those who may have some immunocompromising status, um, who are preterm, um, uh, you know, lower birth weight, all, all sort of factors that, that make kids more vulnerable to infections. Um, so I, I look to my pediatric colleagues, you know, really to, uh, to the expertise they have in terms of when they're going to use it for which cases. Um, but it is always uh, good to have more treatments available. All right. And speaking of treatments, uh, Pfizer's treatment pill, Paxlovid, the White House wants to make this more available to lower risk patients. Do you think that that is a good idea or should that all be reserved for the people who that would be uh, most affected if they had severe COVID? Well, I think that the efforts to expand access to Paxlovid are, are critical. I mean, the Paxlovid rollout really is emblematic and symbolic of the fact that implementing interventions is complicated. So you have this drug that works really well that we can get out to people to prevent progression when, before they have to be hospitalized. It will continue to play a very important role, particularly as immunity wanes and as we may deal with even more severe variants in the future. But so many people can't access it or don't know that they need to access it or um, their doctors don't know who qualifies for it per se, or they live in an area that's just so far away that they're not able to have anybody get it to them because they don't have transportation means to go get it quickly, right? Because there's a, there's a small window there. There are other people that are uninsured who, even though the medication they wouldn't have to pay for, they still have to pay for even the evaluation that's set up at certain clinics. So there's a lot of um, con uh, con uh, complex factors here that are making this rollout happen much slower. And it's not just about getting more drug out there. It's, it's, it's all of these bottlenecks that are coming up. And I worked on a state um, public health response for most of 2020 in Massachusetts. And there, everything was about implementation, getting ventilators to hospitals, getting antiviral medications to hospitals. These are all in short supply, um, figuring out the challenges that hospitals were facing. Uh, similarly now, this is all public health. How do you roll out this antiviral effectively when we have such a disjointed and fragmented healthcare system where a lot of people don't even have a primary care doctor, can't access one quickly, and we're asking them to get uh, antiviral um, that has to be taken in a very specific way and has you know drug drug interactions um, also has to be adjusted for your kidney function and that too been the first five days so as you can see it's a complicated matter certainly okay well we will continue to keep an eye on it as uh the rules and the advice all gets uh, worked into some sort of system thank you for all of your expertise dr abra with uh, stanford healthcare thanks for having me